So, I want to read you two quotes. I love to sit and eat quietly and enjoy each bite, aware of the presence of all my community, aware of all the hard and, lo and loving work that has gone into my food. When I eat in this way, not only am I physically nourished, I'm also spiritually nourished. And the second quote reads, keeping your body healthy is an expression of gratitude to the whole cosmos, the trees, clouds, everything. Does anybody know who said that, those two quotes? Okay, it's Thich Nhat Hanh. If you're not familiar with him, he's a Vietnamese Zen Buddhist monk. And these quotes are very special to me and they drive a lot of my thoughts about just my own personal life, but the work that I do professionally as well. And um, Thich Nhat Hanh, so the particular kind of branch of Buddhism that he promotes is engaged Buddhism. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. It started in Vietnam and it's been spreading throughout the West, but the idea is that rather than just having our practice being on you know, the mat or the, the, the pillow, bringing it off of that and really taking what we learn through the Dharma, what we learn <laughs> through our meditation, through our whole contemplative practice and bring it to the world and, in, and using it to engage in issues, social justice issues, uh, whatever issues we might find relevant in the world. And so, you know, this practice drives the lot of, um, a lot of the work that I do in the world. And, and so what I want to do is just continue by sharing a, an autobiographical narrative that describes the arc of my work around health, food, and farming issues. But my goal is to, because I think everyone in here gets it, right? You guys all eat, like, you're all locavores, right? Okay, you know, I think most people wouldn't have, like, a spiritual practice or grounded, but what I found, especially in audiences like this, is that so often people want to help their family members, their neighbors, their community members change their habits and attitudes and politics. Is this the case for any of you? You guys want to, like, move your family to a different place, help them eat healthier, healthfully, help them understand, you know, the benefits of yoga. I mean, <laughs> I think something that I've seen in myself and so many people, maybe you can relate to this. So often I, when I first started doing this work, tried to take a very heady and intellectual approach to changing people. You know, like, if I could just explain to them how yoga might slow down the catabolic process, or if I could explain how a plant-based diet might help them live more healthily. Does people ever deal with that? <laughs> so, you know, just like, okay, so it, it's, it's something that I think we all might um, experience. And so often, those ways of approaching, you know, family members can turn them off. And so, I, I guess, sharing these best practices, I hope that I might shed some light on ways that you might be able to go back into your community, the way you might be able to approach your parents or your cousins or your neighbor who you genuinely want to see them transform and have a more happy and healthy whole life. So, you know, when I think about the foundation of everything I do, it goes back to family. When I reflect on my childhood, I always think about just the different ways in which Food, community, art, culture, all intersected. And you know, I often draw on this when I'm working with young people. Because I think if you can change the habits and attitudes of a high school, a stubborn high school student who thinks they know everything and who has like these very embedded um, you know, ways of being, then you can change anybody. And so you know, even thinking about my own journey and how I was changed, you know, it wasn't someone lecturing to me and telling me about the benefits of, because I did grow up eating like, you know, what I think most advocates of healthy and sustainable eating would say we all should eat. Food that's as local as a backyard garden, that's grown um, in season, and except for what was pickled and preserved, and that is, you know, grown organically. My grandfather never said he had an organic garden, but he always talked about having a natural garden and not wanting to spray poison on his food. So when I got to high school, I did have this moment of just kind of falling off the wagon, if you will. I don't know if you guys know about this thing called peer pressure, but when I was in high school, I didn't want to be the guy coming to school with baked chicken and sauteed collard greens and homemade biscuits. You know, I wanted to be eating Burger King and McDonald's like all of my buddies on the football team. So I went off the deep end. And it was so important for me to go through this phase and to understand just how addictive and how, you know, you guys have seen Fast Food Nation. Like, this stuff is engineered to addict us. You know, the smells, the taste, the sense, it's all titillating. So 
it's so I'm so fortunate to have gone through that phase. So when I work with young people, I can do it in a way that's non-judgmental and that's loving and compassionate. But um, <laughs> so went through this phase. Immediately saw the the negative effects, lethargy, weight gain, acne. But then there was this, this watershed moment where everything changed. And I like to think this is kind of like the, the embryonic stages of everything that I'm doing now. So it wasn't a lecture. It wasn't someone saying, you need to get things better. You need to eat more healthily. But it was a song. Have you guys ever had a song that just rocked your world, changed everything? A film, a book. Help me out here. Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Some type of product. OK, so. My best friend, Sean Jacobs, comes to my house, and he puts this tape in. I have to explain what tapes are when I'm speaking. <laughs> but he puts this tape in, plays this song, and this just like changes everything for me. And I want to recite this song for you guys. And it goes like this. Beef, what a relief. When will this poisonous product cease? This is another public service announcement. You can believe it, or you can doubt it. Let us begin now with the cow the way that it gets to your plate and how. The cow doesn't grow fast enough for man, so through his greed, he creates a faster plan. He has drugs to make the cow grow quicker. Through the stress, the cow gets sicker. 21 different drugs are pumped into the cow in one big lump, and just before it dies, it cries in a slaughterhouse full of germs and flies, and it gets much more graphic, so I'll stop there. <laughs> um, so I heard this song completely shifted everything, and I don't know if any of you, do we have any people that identify as vegan in the audience? Okay, not to say that all vegans or vegetarians or people with plant-based diets show up in the world like this, but have you ever met a vegan who is, um, how can I put it, dogmatic, <laughs> judgmental, self-righteous, damning you to hell at every possible moment? Okay, so I was that person after I heard beef. And that was such a crucial phase because I learned that you don't bring people into the club by screaming and yelling at them and making them wrong. And not only did people who I just met randomly on the street have to deal with my nonsense, but the people who had to deal with the most were my parents. <laughs> and, you know, it got so bad when, the, so when my mom brought a chicken home for the first time after I decided I wanted to be a hardcore straight edge vegan or whatever. And I threw the chicken away. Which, for her, she was like, it's fine. I'm going to wash the chicken off. And we're going to have chicken, and you aren't. But <laughs> when I buried the chicken in the backyard the next time, <laughs> my dad almost kicked me out of the house. But it's another story. Um, but you know, all these lessons informed the way that I approached working with young people when I founded this organization, Be Healthy. And one of my guiding kind of principles were, was mindfulness and really helping them feel connected to all other living beings and helping them understand that, you know, we're interconnected, no decisions that we make, all the decisions that we make have an effect on all other living beings. And with that hope, or with that teaching them that, with the desire that they make more informed decisions that were for the best good of all other human beings, and so, or all other living beings, you know, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the environment. And so we would, you know, bring these young people in for a year of just kind of transformative workshops, you know, really understanding that in order for them to go out and have an authentic kind of like role in changing people in their community, they had to have a genuine transformation within themselves. So using food as a way to engage in them, getting into the kitchen. And, and just mind you, these were young people coming from communities where their parents worked all the time. They weren't cooking that much. The young people had like a very, just very little connection with real food, you know, diets replete with processed, packaged, um, unhealthy food. And so, you know, for a young person to come in and say, I just don't eat vegetables, or I refuse to drink water, might seem ridiculous, but that was what we were dealing with. And I saw that when we got these young people into the kitchen, and then when we, you know, took them to the farmer's market and helped them select and, and, and prepare food that, you know, was healthy and in season and local and sustainable, they were much more likely to try it. And if they tried it once, they try it again. And so this was kind of like leading them on the path of really engaging with and being connected to healthy, real food. And you know, to this day, as a, as a cookbook author, I see my role um, 
as an organizer and a base builder for this, this kind of movement around creating a more healthy and sustainable food system. Because so often, I think, people start with the politics. They start with the you know, kind of heady intellectual ideas with the hope of moving people. But if people don't feel connected to real food, if they don't feel a deep visceral connection, if they don't feel invested in you know, having these practices in their own life and consuming them, why would they feel compelled to change the structures that prevent people from eating healthily? Why would they feel compelled to actually move to organize others in their community? So I just want to stop and I feel like I'd like to open up the floor to questions, answers, comments, concerns, whatever. Can you tell us some more about what um, Be Healthy does in Oakland, specifically like what the day-to-day, month-to-month looks like in your, in your work? Well, actually Be Healthy no longer exists. I found it in New York City when I was living there and I moved to um, the Bay Area at the end of 2005. We operated for about four years. Um, as I said, our goal was to create a kind of like cadre of young people that would be in the lead of, you know, helping to change people in their own communities, you know, being on the ground, organizing to create more access to healthy and sustainable food. And, you know, at the time, this was like the early part of this day of the, you know, early part of the 20th century. And so there were a lot of people thinking about these issues. This, this was a burgeoning movement. But what I saw was that there were a lot of emphasis placed on um, urban gardens, uh, urban farms, community gardens, and when we would go out and connect with the young people working in these programs, they were growing broccoli rob and kohlrabi and you know all these exotic heirloom varietals, but they didn't know how to make them. And it was, we understood that their families were disconnected from real food because they were in these communities in which, you know, they were working all the time just to keep food on the table, and you know the young people. Um, we're living in these food deserts where they just didn't have a lot of fresh seasonal local produce available and so they didn't have a high food IQ. And so our goal was to, you know, kind of add this missing piece and bring cooking to this movement around food and sustainability so that young people can actually um, have tools that they could take back to their own families so they could have them as adults. But then, you know, as I said, it was such a powerful way of helping them connect with real food um, rather than, you know, lectures or, you know, just these kind of more didactic ways of getting them to think about these issues. Um, we dissolve, but there are organizations across the country that are just doing amazing work, whether it's the People's Grocery in Oakland, California, who started off with urban farms, community gardens, corn patches, moved to actually creating a mobile market where they took a truck that was donated to them, uh, a big kind of like old UPS truck, had artists design beautiful artwork on the outside, put a stereo system that was solar powered, and then actually had a mobile market that went into these low-income neighborhoods bringing produce to the people, selling it at a cheap price, giving it away. There is growing power in the Midwest. Will Allen, who's a farmer who won the MacArthur Genius Fellowship, you know, the Boston, the, the food project in Boston. And so I think we're at this, this, this moment where people across the country are understanding that, you know, we have to move beyond just thinking about making changes as consumers. And I do think it's important that we, you know, we're conscious about the way that we spend our money and, that, and we make decisions about the type of food system that we want to see based on the, 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 the vote of the dollar. However, we also have to think about how can we make change on the ground in communities? How can we make change that is um, owned and driven by people who are living in these kind of historically excluded communities? And I think the ultimate goal is to change policies. You know, how can we ensure that the policies that are being created by our elected officials are to the benefit of everyone and not just the big corporate, um, you know, agri-corporations, you know, not making sure that all the subsidies aren't going to uh, Monsanto and McDonald's, but that they're actually going into community programs and stores, uh, the People's Grocery, that I forgot to mention, their latest venture is they're actually creating a food cooperative in West Oakland, this same community that um, once was this, this major food desert, and it's going to be employing people in the community, creating educational projects, and really ensuring that along with the food, people are um, being educated and empowered to you know, be the leaders in their community around this movement. In your experience, what is the best non-toxic, non-chemical pest uh, repellent in any to keep uh, insects from attacking the gardens uh, that you've been talking about? Wow, I'm not a 
farmer and I'm just a novice gardener at this point, so I really couldn't answer that. Well, if I've heard pepper sprays, I've heard a variety of things, but I'm, I'm um, interested in Cayenne pepper in, in water, um, <laughs> copper around the, um, you know, copper. if you have a raised bed. Um, yeah. yeah, I think um, if you, well, I don't know, eatgrub.org is a great website with uh, a number of resources around everything from uh, sustainable eating to gardening and farming, so you might want to check that, but I don't feel like I can make that much of a well-informed answer. You talked about kids making choices, you talked about policy. Have you thought about doing any work to change the lunches that we serve to our kids in public schools? I have. I actually made attempts to and decided that I would never go near that again in my life. <laughs> it was 2005. We were invited to come. So the, the, the staff of Be Healthy was made up of chefs that I went to culinary school with, um, you know, academics that I went to graduate school with, some activists in the community working around a number of social justice issues. And we were invited to come to a summer program in upstate New York to work on shifting their food practices for the young people that came there. And it was such a just heartbreaking battle. And we had to deal with the people on the ground, the chefs working. And it was just, that's a whole conversation about the resistance that we got from them. But more than that, there were things, just policies in place that made it difficult. Like the fact that these young people, mostly black and brown, had to have milk on their tray every day. And there was nothing that we could do about it. And when you look at the um, studies that show that most African American, Asian, and a number of Latino um, young people, or people just are lactose intolerant, and how this can contribute to a number of other kind of um, health issues you know that was one thing but just even dealing with just the staff and you know getting them to use freshly squeezed orange juice instead of packaged orange juice but then coming into the kitchen and seeing the um, head chef pouring in like a whole bag of sugar and you know just like so many things that made me um, it, it it just made me hard to engage on that level and that's when I decided that I wanted to shift more towards using the media using pop culture um, using books as a way to kind of like engage a mass audience and moving from this local level to doing stuff that um, worked on a national level so in addition to writing books I've consulted on a number of films great resource if you have young people in your life this film what's on your plate um, directed by this uh, filmmaker Catherine Gunn about these two girls in junior high school who set out to discover more about the food system, how they could change it. And so, um, you know, I direct people to the groups that are working on the ground and, and kind of see myself as more of a spokesperson, organizer, you know, in a different way. Yeah. Do you believe in the macro? Uh, I, you know, if I were to encapsulate my own personal diet, mm -hmm. it would be, I would say it's macrobiotic. And so I think that, um, you know, eating in that way certainly is what's most healthy for me. Um, so often what I've seen is that people in, in looking for a healthier diet or a healthier lifestyle, people often kind of choose what they see as the panacea. Oh, the raw food diet, like this is the most healthy diet, it breaks down, it's not like this is it, or the vegan or vegetarian or whatever diet. And I think that, um, you know, plant-based diets are certainly what we all should be um, kind of reaching towards. but. We all have different bodily constitution, cultural food ways. We're at different points in our, you know, at different points in our life, we need different things. What a 13-year-old boy needs is different than what a 65-year-old woman needs. And so, you know, I think people really need to um, kind of check in with their own body, how they feel emotionally, spiritually. I suggest people do a food diary. I do it myself every quarter, like very meticulously documenting meals for a week, how I feel afterward physically, mentally, spiritually, and then just kind of reflecting on what foods I might need to take out of the diet, what foods I might need to um, bring in more. My wife was pretty much a vegan before she got pregnant, and then after that, she just kind of turned to a cave woman. In a good way, <laughs> in a good way because she was eating what she felt like our body That's needed. Well. People might argue that, well, instead of eating red meat, you might be able to get this, but she needed, she, that's what she felt she needed, and so I supported her. And so I think it's really about people determining what's best for them. One of the reasons that I choose not to label myself as a vegan, um, it, it's political. I don't eat any animal products. I don't any, eat any dairy. However, I've seen so many people who feel like they need to kind of like 
get couched into a box. And if they step outside of those boundaries, then they feel like, well, I just kind of, you know, everything's messed up. I just throw my hands up and start eating a lot of meat again. And so <laughs> I want people to be driven by their own values. You know, how do you see, how do you want to see animals treated? How do you want the environment to be, um, you know, how do we want to work towards healing the environment? What type of physical health and well-being do I, I want for myself and my family? Let that drive how we're eating instead of this label that we put on and then kind of following what's prescribed under there. So that's what I um, suggest that people do. And you probably don't eat out very much. Um, I do. I'm kind of how a foodie too. How do you go too. around that? I mean, how do you get healthy food at restaurants? Yeah. Well, I mean, I live in the Bay Area where, you know, you can just walk outside your door and there's a local seasonal sustainable food truck right outside your door literally. you like, what are you parking in front of my house for? <laughs> um, but, you know, it's more difficult, I think, when you're talking about people in the middle of the country, you know, when, when you don't have as long of a growing season. Um, in terms of people who do have access to, you know, I, I tell people that obviously it's best to cook at home as much as you can because, you know, we know that fast food restaurants, too much sodium, too much fat, but even if you go to fine dining restaurants, they use a lot of fat and salt. Yeah, so More than once you consume on a daily basis. What? Because it tastes good. Yeah. Fat and salt and acid taste good. I know that sounds weird, but it's true. Um, one thing I do often, if there's a restaurant that might be a meat heavy restaurant, and I want them to have you know, some entrees that would suit my taste, call ahead. Look, I'm a vegan. I don't eat any dairy products. Would the chef be willing to prepare something that you know would be kind of in line yeah. with what I want to eat? And um, you know, just supporting those businesses that do um, have more local sustainable practices. Actually, and this resonated more as you said, you don't identify as a vegan because of the labeling issue. But I think the perk of labeling for a lot of the rest of the world is that they get you, is that they know what your dietary restrictions will be. Yeah. I read this book, Eating Animals, by Jonathan Safran Foer. This a few months back, and this has really gotten me thinking about a lot of these issues even more because of that book. And one of the things he really gets into with his family is that his dad started asking him growing up as he had all these things in his consciousness, any, any particular dietary restrictions I need to know about today? Because people go through these kind of phases. Um, so what I really wanted to ask was, because you touched on the issues with your family early on, do you have any particular advice for how to deal with people who might be in one's family that continue to eat factory farmed meat, but won't have the conversation about it. Yeah, don't have the conversation. <laughs> well, I, I'm being kind of tongue in cheek. I say don't have the conversation oh. in terms of <laughs> when I was going through my very dogmatic phase and screaming and yelling at all my family. They soon it was almost this Pavlovian response. They're like, "He's coming. Let's go the other way." Yeah. And so nah. I think that <clears throat> so many people have these triggers around people who might be eating more healthfully or living a more healthy lifestyle because deep down I think everyone wants to live you know healthy and, and a wholesome life and want to have you know just these deeply embedded spiritual and physical activity practices and eating habits but so often people don't know how to get over that hump or they have resistance or whatever issues and so it brings up stuff for people you know when you say I'm a vegan um, <coughs> people automatically have these stereotypes, these assumptions about who you are, your approach, and you know just what you might be bringing. And so I do think it's important for people to plant that pole. Like I respect and am so supportive of like far, far left vegans who are just like, I'm hardcore vegan, I'll cut you. But <laughs> for me, and, and so that approach, uh, I mean, yeah, but that approach often just like reaches such a small group. My my goal is to to deeply impact as many people as possible, and so with my family, rather than the way that I used to, hey, this is the vegan dish on the table, eat it, it's healthy, whatever. I'll, I'll give an example. There's a family gathering we had a couple summers ago, and it was during the summer. Somebody brought you know the kind of typically drowned in mayonnaise potato salad. I made a roasted red potato salad with parsley pine nut pesto, kind of like inspired by these traditional um, potato salads. Rather than announcing it, rather than talking about how healthful it is, because it's extra virgin olive oil and local basil from the farmer's market or whatever, I just put it on the table. <laughs> I went to do something and came back, and most of that salad was gone. And then the, the regular potato salad was still there. People asked me questions about it. 
you know, people wanted to know more about why did the potatoes taste so much fresh? You know, my family members who grew up eating like the, the pears and peaches from next door that were so succulent and sweet and, you know, locally harvested green from the backyard garden, they, when I take them food from the farmer's market that's around the corner from them that they never go to, they're like, oh my God, this is so <laughs> flavorful and sweet. And it's because they've been on this industrial treadmill. They've been eating food from the supermarkets and this industrial food that's flown across the globe or uh, you know, in refrigerators for weeks that's so denatured and so unflavorful that when they have this local sustainable food, it just blows them away. And so you know, a lot of times, that's what I appeal to. Just self-interest, more than talking about the benefits of you know, the environment, local economies on the animals, it's just gonna be so much more flavorful if you go to the farmer down the street than going to that Kroger around the corner from you. That's what I tell my, my you know, family members. And so my kind of guiding mantra of the past decade has been start with the visceral, move to the cerebral, and end at the political. And for me, the visceral is like the, the, the sensual pleasures of the table. You know, getting people together, building community around good food that's locally grown, that's seasonal, that's sustainable, and then moving more into the, because people ultimately want to know more about it. You know, they want to talk about it, and then just with the hope of eventually helping them understand that if you really want to ensure that everyone has access to this, it can't be just about like you personally making change and changing habits in your family, but really ensuring that the policies in place are um, allowing everyone to have this good food. So, hope this helpful. <laughs>